Okay, as I mentioned in the introduction, so we start with this lecture from daily life to the Big Bang. So we'd like to start with what we experience in, you know, just the ordinary daily life. And I point out that some of these questions about, you know, our really daily experience already has to do with the universe in outer space. We don't normally think about it that way, but that is actually true. So I'd like to emphasize the connection from daily life to the Big Bang. Namely that what we experience on daily life, familiar phenomena, uh, actually ha turns out to have a cause, if you think about it, what is causing that, uh, are deeply rooted in the structure of the universe and the nature of the composition universe that is actually made up of tiny particles, elementary particles. So that's the connection I'd like to get started with today. So the first subject is something you take for totally granted, night and di day. So if you wake up in the morning, you know, you, you don't have to think that the sun would go up and later that day, sun would go down. And that's absolutely normal. We take that for granted. We never question why that happens. But that already has to do with the fact that we are actually sort of floating in outer space and, and, and rotating around. And of course, every, every one of you knows this. So the many phenomena we see today actually have some background in what's going on in outer space. So as you see here in this animation, the day is because the part of the Earth received light from the sun, right? But we know the Earth rotates. So only the part of the Earth that's facing the sun is lit up and, and becomes a day. But the other side is in the shadow of the Earth itself, and that's the night. And as the Earth rotates around, different parts of the world get shown by the sunlight. And that's how we think the sun rises and sets. But you know, if you think about this, just the fact the sun rises and sets has to do with the fact that Earth is somewhere in space and sort of hanging in there and, and rotates on, around its axis. And that's how we can understand the night and day. So even something that feels you know, completely for taken for granted, the sun rises and sets every day, it has to do with the fact that we are actually living in space, in a universe, and uh, uh, we receive the light from the sun. So that, I believe, is a very good example that what we experience in, in a very familiar way in a daily life has to do with what's going on in the universe. So many phenomena we take for granted require thinking about, actually, outer space and how the universe uh, actually works. But now you have to think about the following question. So suppose you time slip back into some ancient times, and when everybody believed that Earth was flat, and, and there was no uh, space uh, that's around us, and we are actually the center of the universe, and, and you try to tell them that that's actually not the case. And if you try to tell them, well, that day, day in light was already an evidence that we are sort of hung in empty space, again, receiving the light from the sun, they may not agree with you, because they may still think that, well, okay, Earth is flat, there's some end to it, and the sun rises from one end, and then sets on the other end, and everybody else on in this outer sphere, which has nothing to do with us. But then you can point out the fact that there are four seasons we experience in our yearly cycle. And that has to do more with the fact that we revolve around the sun, and then they will probably have a difficult explaining what's going on. So think about how we might explain this fact to the ancient people and see uh, how you will be successful. So that will be my next subject, Four Seasons. And as you, of course, know that the Earth revolves around the Sun once a year. And the way we understand the seasons is the fact that the Earth rotating axis is actually not straight up, but slightly tilted. And that's what you see, actually, for example, in this picture here. So this is a situation uh, in the summer in the Northern Hemisphere. And you see the axis pointing out this way. So what's going on here is that Earth is tilted towards the Sun if you happen to live in the Northern Hemisphere. In the same way, if you happen to live in the Southern Hemisphere, and the opposite end of this rotation, uh, revolution around the Sun, then the Southern Hemisphere is pointed towards the Sun uh, in this season. But in the same season, Northern Hemisphere is pointed away from the Sun. And that is what determines the four seasons. So if you're living in the Northern Hemisphere, here you're pointed towards the sun, and that would get you receive more sunlight. But as the Earth revolves around the sun, it's always tilted this way, and it keeps coming this way now, and that's 
the, uh, the fall. And then it doesn't matter if it's tilted this way or that way because you're receiving sunlight from that end. And if it comes to the winter, then you are tilted away from the sun. So that would get you uh, receiving less sunlight. And then if you come back to the spring, again, it's sort of the, the uh, you're getting the sunlight from sideways. It doesn't matter which way it's, it's tilted. And then you can eventually come back to the sun when you receive more sunlight again. So this understanding can be immediately proven just by looking at the variation of temperatures between northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. So in northern hemisphere, uh, I live to in Tokyo and California, so both are northern hemisphere, then you receive more sunlight in the summertime, let's say June, July. That's when the temperature is high, when it's warm. But in December, January, then you receive less sunlight and temperature is low. On the other hand, if you live in Sydney or anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere, it goes the other way. In the month of, say, June, July, you actually receive less sunlight because you are tilted away from the sun. But in January and December timeline, then you receive more sunlight and the temperature is warmer. So the variation of temperatures are opposite between Northern and, and Southern Hemisphere. So, and when I actually learned about this in school, and I got really moved that you can understand these seasonal variations by the fact that Earth is moving around the sun. So that's actually a phenomenon happening in a universe. You really have to think about outer space to understand this phenomenon. And just to show you why the tilting towards the sun or tilting away from the sun really tells you the difference between how much sunlight you receive during the summertime and night uh, and winter time. So when you're facing head on towards the sun, then you, the whole area you're pointing to, it receives the sunlight fully. But if you are tilted away from the sun, so it's like this picture, so your area is now tilted away, and then you receive less sunlight, as you see here. So when the tilting angle is 60 degrees, as in picture, then you receive only half of the sunlight, as you can see. And that goes by the cosine, the sinusoidal uh, function uh, and trigonometric function. So depending on the tilting angle, uh, you can immediately compute how much sunlight you actually receive uh, based on that angle. So that's how we understand the four seasons. But when I learned about this in school, I naturally wondered about the following. Well, if this is the right explanation for the four seasons, there's another way we should be able to actually test this idea. So if this is true, there must be actually two summers at the equator. Or what I mean by this? Well, if you happen to live on the equator, let's say in the summer month in Northern Hemisphere, then you see the equator is not facing right at the sun, right? It's actually sort of tilted down that way. When you come to the fall, then the sun is, is, is shining from sideways, then you get all of the sunlight you can ever get. And when you go to winter month in Northern Hemisphere, again, equator is now this way, so you're not pointing straight at the sun. So you receive less sunlight in the winter month and summer month, but you get the full sunlight in the fall and in the spring. And when I told my, uh, 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 um, uh, the, the teacher that you know, this should be the case, then uh, my teacher didn't believe it. So I had to go to my library my, on my own and actually uh, look up on the temperature variation in equatorial region, regions. And let's say this is Nairobi in Africa. That's very much on the equator. And when I look at the data, uh, it actually looks like this. So you can easily see that you get very high temperatures in March and October. So that's sort of the spring and fall in the northern or southern hemisphere. And when it is the summer in the northern hemisphere, uh, like this month, then the temperature actually goes down. And that happens again in the winter month. So that's exactly what you expect based on the idea we talked about just a minute ago. So this is the way you can verify that our understanding is indeed correct. So in the equatorial, equatorial regions, then you get actually two summers and two winters every year. And that's the way we really understand what's going on. So uh, uh, if you think about you know, what you might learn in school and what I'm going to tell you actually in, in this uh, subsequent part of my lectures, don't just accept them as fact right away. You should think about how you might be able to test that idea on your own or by studying on your own. And, and you have to come up with your own understanding what's going on there without just absorbing what I'm going to tell you in my lectures.